Good evening, and welcome to the first night of the 2020 Prout Chapel BFA Capstone Readings. We have three writers presenting their work tonight. Their work forms part of their BFA theses and represents their accomplishments as writers while part of the program. While a great accomplishment in and of itself, the work also serves as a foundation for the writing they will do in the years to come and that we can all look forward to. Our first writer this evening is Z Brower. Z is a poet of family history, of relationships, of nature. Her poetry frequently displays a double consciousness. For instance, when writing about a six-year-old's vision of her mother, Z can both invoke the naivete of the six-year-old and also the perspective of a mature writer looking back in time with wisdom and empathy. She also has the vision to allow images to invoke a feeling in readers. Rubber bands, an old tube of lipstick, a broken watch, tell the story of family history far more effectively and with more power than any abstract generalizations. And she finds language that is fresh and new and makes us see. The clouds creasing an Arizona sky, or the lacquered smile of a friend who might not really be a friend. Our second reader this evening is Justice. A fiction writer who works both in realism and fabulism, Justice creates stories that show an awareness of the shadow side of humanity. She draws from readings of traditional tales, fairy tales and lore, that inexhaustible treasure house, and creates new stories, not merely retellings, and makes them newly relevant. And she draws from American culture, the circus, the sideshow, to create a contemporary coming-of-age story with a twist. Her realist work also demonstrates a control of suspense. It doesn't fall into horror, and yet it makes it clear that horror is very possible. Our third reader this evening is Andrew Wood. Andrew works in both fiction and poetry. In his poetry, he sometimes works in form, like the Sestina, using form to find his way to insights that might otherwise remain distant. His poetry is seeking, searching for understanding of topics like love, spirituality, identity. And yet, the voice that comes to the fore in his poetry is often self-aware, with some ironic distance on the project of understanding itself. The fiction in his thesis comes from a world of his own invention that still invokes some of our oldest archetypes. Brother versus brother, revenge for the death of a son, or a Faustian bargain for power. I hope you'll enjoy the work of all three writers this evening as I have. Hi everybody, I'm Z, and this is my uh, BFA reading. Uh, I have taken it upon myself to get a little cozy, and I hope that you have done the same, given the opportunity that this isn't normal prout, so I hope you're in your PJs, honestly. That's what I wish for all of you. Uh, to start off today's reading, I'm going to read a poem called Cigarette Smoke Signals. And uh, titles do a lot for uh, most of my pieces. And this one is uh, specifically inspired, and you'll see a lot of cigarette imagery in general throughout this, because uh, a lot of my friends like still smoke cigarettes. And so while uh, not the healthiest of habits, it is, uh, it, it looks, it looks cool. It does. Come on. You, it, it looks kind of cool. And so, uh, I use a lot of imagery like that in my poems. And so, this is Cigarette Smoke Signals. He had a mouth like a sawed-off shotgun, full of birdshot teeth and secrets, constantly fuming from heavy use and warm to the touch of fingertips. Smoke ringlets rise, cover sky gray eyes. Clean air tinged in second hand experience. I crave the smell. 
I've learned how to shotgun a hit better than I breathe on my own. My fingertips tinged with ash, moral backlash from needing so much of him. He smells flammable, almost as if any spark could set him ablaze, render him to tinder, box him up, and watch as he burns into ash. They say there's nothing cleaner, but I know better. I disagree. This next poem is written from the point of view of a worm every single morning because that's how I feel every single morning. I wake up a worm every day of my life. This is called, It's a Beautiful Morning, parentheses, for my demise. Blackberry bushes lie in gray light as dew-coated trees frame the morning. As dawn approaches, so does the end. The end of safety, of cover. Only cliffhangers until tomorrow. The voice of a hundred chirping birds signals the start. Beaks, needle-sharp, and ready for the dark, ripened earth. For as it is said, the early worm is caught by the bird. Uh, this next poem is, uh about the the moment typically in movies where uh, you open the door and your ex-significant other is standing there or your ex-friend or some sort of other toxic person that has left a life uh, not like dead but you know has has gone out of your life or a protagonist's life and uh, this is the moment where they try to worm their way back in Worm. Ah, I'm so sorry I said the word worm directly after my worm poem. We're all just gonna move on. This is called, Does it count as old friends if all you did was fuck and fight? Her dripping hair puddles on my front steps. The dampness seeps up my bones and I'm suddenly colder than the parting glances I gave her. She blinds me with headlight eyes I remember from months ago when she'd bum cigarettes and fantasize about getting run over. Her face is drowning, streetlight filled puddles on her cheeks. She whispers something but I get lost in the mist. She always could cloud my judgment. Then again, can't I stay just for the night? But her night isn't based on the cycles of moon and sun. Her night is as long as she feels dark and delicate, eyes like hesitant, hesitant stars blinking an SOS down to earth. Uh, as you may have noticed, a lot of my poetry comes from a fairly, fairly personable and uh, feeling-based voice. And uh, there are a couple poems in here that I have uh, pushed myself in order to just write image-based or just write uh, sort of this specific third person back a bit like type of voice. And so that's where you get poems like Arizona Atmosphere. Clouds crease the sky, mar the cool blue with white shards. The sun becomes a harsh surprise. It leans, wavering in and out of view, making it swing around our sky. Rock makes hard cuts on the earth, cool and tough. The sides of pillars reach up, giving a throat to the moon that a keen sharp eye can see in the night. Blue brews of water swing me to ruin around the dark and wavering plains. Hold the belief that beauty holds the eye. As, it, as I have said, uh, my titles are pretty important and they oftentimes set up context for the poems that aren't explicitly stated in the poems themselves. It's uh, a bit of a step back, I guess. It's a bit of a uh, tongue-in-cheek and it also does the interesting thing, which is create sort of a false expectation of the tone of the poem that you're going into. With all that said, this poem is called When Your Girlfriend Cheats On You For Three Months And Doesn't Tell You. She looks at me with seedless eyes, and I can never look at her too closely when she feels like this. 
Her thoughts worm into my own head, pierce my skin, and leave their trails in my soft white matter. I squirm and try not to wither next to her. I let her stew in the air she's steeped. There's silence thicker than ale, and I drink down sweet lies and sour liquor, and I pretend that I don't know. I don't know what she's done, but it hangs in the air like the apple, and while I've never been Eve, I've never held that bite against her. Words overripe and sickly sweet. Fruit rots from the inside out, just as I did, fermenting once again. Speaking of dichotomies and titles, this next one is called Reunions. I hear your knocking and it falls in line with the echoing in my hollowed chest. My copper-coated insides corrode as they grow close to your caustic source. I see myself as I was, as we were. Long hair and longer silences caught up between indelicate finger folding. Saccharine lacquered melted candy lips smile as I open the door and invite you in. Uh, the next poem that I have is uh, a bit tongue-in-cheek as because that's new. Uh, this is about um, the process of playing with words as a poet and trying to shape that into a poem. And so basically what I'm trying to say is that I wrote a poem about writing poems. And it's called, I Just Need to Craft. It's dizzying. Tragic pirouettes around calcified minds too hard on dainty feet. It's disintegrating. Effortless cigarettes ash into decaying puddles, spill up out of mouths. It's decarnate. Catching silhouettes falling across pavement arch around earth. It's derivative, internal vignettes surrounding finds inside dark corners illuminating musings. It's diabolical, laughing roulettes cross beneath noses, none any the wiser. It's despicable, asinine regrets over lists devoted to pure poetic playgrounds and nothing more. The next poem is about bees, because who doesn't love a good bee poem? Uh, there was an article that was published a while ago that uh, talked about how, uh, when observed in their hive, bees often interact with other bees the way that we tend to interact with people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it talked about how the bees seem to have like these feelings, these mundane feelings towards other bees around them. And I thought that was really interesting and really cool. And so I wrote a poem about it and it's called Intimate Lives. Layers within the hive mind lays out inches and miles of untapped lives. Discoveries and dives inside are relied on to inspire us to intimacy we must cultivate within ourselves. Admired scientists show us that atoms and the universe live parallel lives. It stands to reason that it should feel familiar seeing such insight inside others. And immediately after that, we have another bug poem. Just showing up all over the place. Uh, this one is a little bit less direct, though. So there's that. This is called Ceaseless Cricket Noises Only Make Me Anxious. He started in my hand and crept into my chest, made himself a home in my heart. He chirps with each beat, count the ones in 25 seconds, divide by three, add four to see if I'm feverish or panicked or madly in love. He's jumping along my ribs and they may be starting to bruise because it's getting harder to breathe. This next poem is uh, based on a prompt that we had to write about where you are from. And I've moved a lot since I was a kid, and this is about the first house that my family ever really lived in. And it uh, 
kind of corners the market on all of my aspects as a poet. It talks about childhood and nostalgia, but like a twisted sort where there are no rose-tinted glasses. It talks about uh, weird small little images that are oddly intimate. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really all I write poetry about. So this is, this is it. This is the pinnacle. And it's called, I'm Still Glad We Moved. Underneath the back porch of the old house, there are decaying candy wrappers from when my sister and I sat outside eating Halloween loot until we were sick. Weeds and small, delicate-looking flowers sprouting through cracks in moss-covered brick where no progress has been made since Dad left. Rubber bands from my younger sister's braces that we would shoot out into the yard or at each other. Pieces of the wedding quilt my mother tore off to make internal tourniquets. The tube of cupcake-flavored chapstick I applied right before my first kiss. The tooth I knocked out of the kid who dared to call my sister a slut. Crumpled drafts of poems I wrote, rewrote, and then just threw out when words wouldn't work. The pieces of the old gold watch Papa gave Dad, back when things were still good. When nobody yelled or cursed at each other, when my sister and I didn't have to pack suitcases twice a week and get exchanged in the parking lot of a goddamn Denny's. Each shard lay surrounding the tarnished, ever-frozen hands covering the face. And I still remember what my mom said to me when I showed her the pieces of the only gift her family ever gave him. Some things just aren't meant to be fixed. The next poem that I have, uh, I was told, had one of the biggest OK Boomer moments in a poem that, that I've written, so I... Obviously, I'm going to have to read that one. And it's called, We're Barely Treading Water and You Want Us to High Dive? Inhale for a short time, remember how to exhale. They eat us in schools, in shops and streets, usually alive, sometimes dead, for they are not afraid of expensive consequences. But we are. And we feel vexation from the victim's skin. The urge to flee does not ripen in them. It never will. They are gradually devouring us as the whole world sees. Frightened little creatures raising the alarm. The last poem that I'm going to read for you guys was a prompt based on putting uh, pop culture in a song. And I chose the Beatles because I like to be a stereotype. And so uh, this is called Won't You Please, Please, Please Me. My father loved the Beatles more than he loved my mother, even as he saw her standing there, Lennon on her own lips. Memories of his hands tapping on steering wheel and dashboard, lights at shows for cover bands, I want to hold your hand, said enough times, I'm sure he thought we knew the words, but we just wanted help crossing an empty road, barefoot, eyes closed. And that's it for my thesis reading. I hope you all had a good time. I hope that you all are staying safe and staying inside and all of the other things that everyone has been telling you for the past month and a half. Uh, but that's it. That's what I got. So I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you have a good rest of your night. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be doing my reading of a short story about a girl walking home alone at night. This is Take What You Need. Walking alone at night is fine. Most of the sidewalks are near a pretty busy road with a generous amount of streetlights, and the longest this walk has ever taken in the early afternoon was only about 45 minutes. Really, it will be good to stretch her legs a little. It'll get her settled down for sleep when she gets home. All she has to do is pay attention. Don't bother with headphones or music. Don't stop or get distracted. Just walk quickly, and she will be fine. 
Standing safely in the bus stop shelter, her back to the corner of the little half room as if still holding on to a thread of hope that a last impossible bus will come by, Holly checks her phone. 10.07. Close enough to not too late for urban miracles, but officially too late as far as bus route signs go. Faced with either walking home or leaving herself stranded in the shelter until the route starts again at 6 this morning, Holly leaves, phone in her pocket, hands curled with casual tightness around her backpack straps. Almost everything about what faces her now would be much preferred at 10.07 in the morning instead of at night. If this happened at 10.07 in the morning, Holly knows anger would coil tightly within her, quickening her steps as her mind railed against her, or her school, or her work, or the foot traffic, or the line at this restaurant, or that convenience store, or whatever else could be blamed for her lateness. The low whine at the temper tantrum at the back of her mind would be a great motor, puttering her along with ease and distracting her from all the inconveniences of the walk. That ugly annoyance would be better right now than the fear she knows is expected of her. But she insists on not being afraid. The sun had been late going down still, and the breeze passing around her stirs loose leaves and smells of the rain she'd enjoyed just hours ago. Street lights and stoplights and headlights cast a layer of pale haze over the sky as she looks up, turning the bluish black into a smoky shade, the stars appearing as flat dots of occasional brilliance among it. This loveliness shouldn't be ignored just because the moon hung over her instead of the sun. Her eyes are fixed on the sky while her feet carry her along the sidewalk without aid. Metal hits her face. She gasps, maybe. If she did, it was muffled by the cold, comical thunk of her nose colliding with the pole. The streetlight stands in the same place Holly has always known it to be, indifferent to her nervous laughter at herself. The only danger to me out here is myself, she thinks, carefully touching her nose, which doesn't feel broken. Reflexive tears had sprung out of her eyes at the sharp pain, and she stares at the pole as she blinks and rubs them away. When the clouds smear away from her eyes, she's looking at a poster on the pole. Missing, it tells her. It's surrounded by some less grim postings. The scraped up remains of old local band stickers, the fresh new stickers slapped over them, audition flyers, roommate ads, farmer's market announcements, free puppies and or kittens from whole litters, club and bar ads. Each one is colorful, the ink having run and mingled with each other in the day's rain. Feeling her curiosity trying to pull her towards the missing poster, she forces herself to instead look intently at one of the papers with tear-offs tabs, swollen with rainwater, unwilling to stir in the light wind. It's one of those cheesy, take what you need flyers. Many of the tabs have been pulled away, and only optimism, humility, realism, and clarity remain. Somewhat disappointed, but still feeling the morbid pull, she takes the last tab, thick and soft and loose in her hand. What other virtues and blessings were there earlier today? She tries to think on this, to wonder who took what, and she's pulled back to the missing poster despite herself. Lost pet posters pop up on the pole seemingly every day, but they're all labeled as such. Lost. Missing is always saved for people. Holly looks beneath it, that desperate missing, and a girl looks back at her. The picture is oldish, too dried and faded by the sun for the ink to run from the rain, but the girl is ghostly and vague, her shape blending in nearly seamlessly with the sparse background. It had been cropped well, framing the girl from her shoulders up. Blonde hair that now looks almost white hangs over one shoulder in a ponytail, and a sincere smile lights up her face in a bright, berry pink U shape. Unable to stop herself now, Holly reads the rest of the flyer. Cassie is blonde, has brown eyes, weighs 130 pounds, and is 5 feet 5 inches tall, it tells her. She'd been last seen alone, disappearing into the thin wooded brush around her backyard for a presumed walk, the missing person's poster tells Holly. She turns her eyes back to the sky, this time not risking the effort of walking into the next pole down the road. The dusty filter has stayed over it, the stars still twinkling through, only at certain angles, and it doesn't look like the moon has moved much in its journey across the sky. Feeling as if there is a time limit she's forgotten about, she steps around the pole and keeps going. High school was the last time she'd lived in a place with a backyard. College dorms had fields and streets and campus life buzzing behind them. Apartments had towns and pools. But no back door leading out to a concrete porch that gave way to grass, that gave way to tall grass, that gave way to creeks and trees and bushes and other things less contained. That's how her backyard had been. The one she hadn't enjoyed since, sh since she was a teenager. Clean and orderly for a minimum respectable distance past the house, then growing wild into patches of brush that grew thicker the further you went. Holly had never been brave enough to go far, and had lost interest in trying to explore it deeply sometime in the middle of high school, but she can still clearly remember crawling through the denser, shorter parts of the brush, 
standing up when it finally cleared to moss and twigs and underbrush, looking up at the trees that towered over her, looking ahead at the space that both stopped in a tangle of green and went on forever in rough gray-brown. The air moved slower there. Everything past the sharp, sticky brushes was too big, too heavy, too movable for it, for it or any part of it to be shaken by wind. The branches and leaves swayed as if only humoring the wind, but the only thing moving the twigs or the fallen leaves on the ground was the feet of passers-by, human or not. How long had she spent standing there looking the same way Cassie must have? Not long at all, she thinks, because she remembers being both frustrated and frightened that she could never see anything from where she was. A handful of minutes would pass, and she would turn around and go back inside. Holly tries to stay present, rooting the cars as they blow past and poking her fingertips with each of the keys in her pocket, trying to determine which would be sharpest. Much of her mind is occupied with her own potential missing poster. Missing. Holly Palmer, 25. Brunette. Brown eyes. Tan complexion. 5 feet 4 inches. 126 pounds. What picture would they use? There are quite a few to choose from. She's not camera shy. But a lot of them are group shots. They would have to crop the image, cutting off the heads of the friends on either side of her, leaving behind only an unidentified arm thrown over Holly's shoulder to hint that someone else had once been there. Holly Palmer, missing. Where was she last seen? It could be almost anywhere at the university. Any of the bars she and her friends retreat to on the weekends. Maybe the grocery store or the pharmacy. She realizes it could even be somewhere she's never been before, and tries to picture a new and faraway place. Maybe Holly Palmer, missing, last seen in one of the several stairwells of an office building in Iowa. Holly Palmer, missing, last seen lying down in a truck bed in the parking lot of a Michigan Walmart. Last seen on the shoulder of a Kansas highway. Last seen in a Wawa bathroom in Florida. Hey! Headlights draw closer, casting Holly's shadow long before her, pointing the length away from the car she should be by now, but isn't. She stops looking at the car's passenger side window rolls down. She stops looking as the car's passenger side window rolls down. Hey, the man in the driver's seat repeats, smiling apologetically as he leans a little closer to the open window. I'm sorry to yell at you, but my phone's dead and I've been driving circles around this place forever. Do you know where the closest motel is? I was following my GPS before my phone died and I thought it was around here. It's such a reasonable request. Such a common and shitty situation. Holly smiles unsurely to give herself time while she thinks. Why was this man looking for a motel? Why didn't he have a car charger for his phone? She wishes she could have seen his car's license plate, eyes flickering down towards the back of the car, unsuccessfully. And then maybe he's visiting someone. Ah, let me see, she mumbles, eyes wandering to the back seat of the car, dark and indiscernible, and the trunk beyond. It looked roomy. At least one of her could fit in it. She looks back to the man whose eyes seem to have not moved from her. I'm not sure. I'll look it up for her, she says at last. I'm not sure. I'll look it up for you, she says at last. Taking a few subconscious steps away from the car, she pulls up the Maps app on her phone. The first, list, the first result lists a hotel close to her apartment complex, and so she ignores it. It's a local place, not a chain, she tells the man. That's fine, that's fine, he says, annoyance-tinted fatigue leaking through in his tone. Where is it? Holly looks at him once more, his brow drawn slightly downward, shadows under his eyes. She gives him the address, but she speaks too quickly or too quietly. What? Just let me see, the man says impatiently, undoing his seatbelt to move closer. Holly Palmer, missing. Last seen at night, only a few blocks away from her apartment. It occurs to Holly that she can say no, that she can just repeat herself with more clarity. But it's expected of her to turn her phone around to show him, and so that's what she does. Stepping one foot closer, holding out the phone almost to arm's length. Between the fear her nerves insist she must feel and the effort of holding the phone steady, her hand is shaking slightly. The man tries to follow it with his eyes, only to huff and reach out and hold it himself. His fingers clamp down on the bottom of the phone and her little finger. It doesn't hurt, but Holly lurches back at the gesture, and he's blind to her shock. His eyes are squinted, looking intently at the address as he mouths it to himself. Satisfied that it's committed to memory, he lets go of the phone and settles back into his seat. Got it, he says. Thanks a lot, miss. Get home safe. And he drives off. Holly watches as the car leaves, peels down the slightly slick road, and turns left to the intersection where she will turn where she will turn right. 
Surprised beyond believing her surroundings, she stuck for a moment, listening. The man's tires are too far away to hear now, along with all the other cars that must be passing on roads just a little bit away from her. There are no other footsteps, no voices, no breathing. Passing sounds of life are muffled and far off. Only the background sound to her own life, which, for this moment, is in no peril at all. Thank you. Okay, I've had some self-care. I'm dressed up from the waist up. <clears throat> Let's do this. Uh, my name is Andrew Wood. I don't know what introduction things have happened um, with how weird this all is, but I hope you all enjoy. Um, I do a little bit of poetry, a little bit of fiction, um, so I'll be giving you um, some of that, some stuff in between, and hopefully we'll have a good time. Uh, this first one is called... Uh, in which I highlight the words of love that have been interpreted as charity. It's a blackout poem from the Bible passage, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and it originally started from winter wheat, so here we go. In which I highlight the words of love that have been interpreted as charity. If I speak the tongue of an angel, have charity. I move mountains and have charity. Deliver my body so that I burn. Charity is patient, not perverse. Puffed up, ambitious, seek her. Rejoice with all things. Hope never falleth away. Be made void or tongues shall cease. Part in part, all is perfect. When I was little, I understood little. When I was made, I did the things that belonged. Now in dark, face to face, I know I am here. <clears throat> this next one is called The Smith of Poor Metal. Take a hammer to iron made red hot from burning bodies. Shape the shard to your shins, press it glowing with heat against your bare skin, temper it with your boiling blood. You are armored now. But your legs are blackened, not unlike all the rest who lie in the embers behind you. Molten shadows cast into the room. Your leg wound cauterized but was not cleaned. It is protected, and the flesh on your once exposed leg will never heal. When infection creeps into what skin is left, like a rat trapped in a heated steel bucket, burrowing to escape red-hot metal on its skin, deep into the safety of your calf, protected, you will die anyway. The irony shell you've built will only protect bones, until even it is eaten by air. Then someone will come, sweep the rust away, and discard your skeleton, the thing that was only supposed to hold you up into the coals with all the rest. Your premature cremation will eventually be finished by someone new who will take up your tools unaware they're yours, if they even are anymore, and make some last beautiful creation before letting a hammer melt with all the rest. This next one is um, one of those sort of hybridy works, sort of not quite poem, not quite short story. It's called Worship. The sun wept, flooding the living, growing land with streams of water and gold, where it collected in valleys and deer drank first, growing a crown. All other creatures bowed to their king, save wolf and viper stalking in crags and cavern shade. Man, watching from far away, felt a pulse of salt and silt in his heart. He hunted deer but felt the deer's antlers only fitting as a mantelpiece. Man clawed through the clay, stole the water's gold, and poured the liquid sunlight to shape his own crown. Still unsatisfied, he begged the sun for more, so she let her breath to the ice caps, and the sea swelled. Even wolf and viper felt fear and anger at the sun for showing she favored man, and then sought to consume her as consequence. It wasn't that she favored man, she just wanted him to be happy, and none others had asked for more than they had. Even so, Wolf chased her beyond the horizon each night, 
his massive maw agape. And viper wrapped itself around her world, thinking to poison its waters and draw her out. So man sought to hunt them too, and turn their strengths to his own designs. He tamed wolf and made medicine from viper's venom. He made stories about the animal's failed attempts, mockeries and myths meant to teach lessons about greed and arrogance. Man did not listen to his own stories. Once he learned to set sail, travel to the sun's treasures was simple and swift. He forged factories for crowns and filled the sky with choking smoke, which blocked her light, and still man asked for more. The sun could no longer see, for she had been blinded by tears for some time. She obliged. She watched and waited for him to realize what he asked, to realize that she bowed to no king even if they begged. All she had given had been gifts, and they could not be taken back. But man did not beg. He did not even ask. He did not even notice until too late that he had created a crucible of the earth. <clears throat> Some of these get a little depressing. <laughs> this one's called The Long Road Home. Something is so alluring about a cloudy night and the light of a full moon. Snow has fallen across the sky. Looking up, we sink without the sinking feeling. Strange how butterflies flying inside us are always equated to falling. Suddenly we are underneath the surface of the transparent earth, seeing through the stones masking impregnability. We are the earth. Canopy of trees with white leaves which blow in the wind. Flawless blanket one moment. Then, like remembering a good idea, deep tumultuous shadows appear. Maybe just branches. Could be miles deep. Are we beneath ocean trenches? Is that what mountains look like inverted? A star, scarcely seen, peeks out to assure us they are not all gone, and another, which turns out just to be a plane. Impossible, you think, that they don't get lost amidst the pale half-light, but they have machines. You remember navigating the thick air doesn't require sight. In fact, looking at it is what steals away your attention to begin with. But without looking, you would never even see them. And so many things are so alluring about a cloudy night in the light of the full moon. Um, I don't have a lot of stories for these. I'm sorry. <laughs> Glad to have been. I like to ponder the existence of God while listening to Christian rock in my car at 1030 at night. When I get home, I sit, hoping to be inspired until the song disgusts me. Even in the throes of empty yields from my procrastination, I could ask you anything. Even if not held captive, passenger seat, audience, you would answer. <laughs> you are leaving. Under the weighted sky, I didn't notice until now. I ask when. The stench of pessimism. Eventually. I don't know when eventually is. Uh, this next one was originally called The Hangman, and I wanted to do a whole bunch of different things with it, um, and I was told not to do that. <laughs> and I think it ended up uh, ultimately being for the best. Um, this next poem is also a Sestina, and it is called Toll. Higher, higher, a girl cries, the sun in her voice, as a man pushes her on an ancient swing. At the top, she says she can see the world. A simple plank on two ropes gives the girl far more than the simple means of the man. All his efforts pale to a seat swaying. The tree's twisted branches sway. The rope creaks like his grandfather's voice. The girl doesn't notice, but the man does. His tired arms keep pushing the swing because of how happy it makes the girl, but he is not strong enough to carry the world. But should she fall, 
He knows he could catch his world and hold her at least until his legs stop swaying. He is pulled back to the moment by the girl's laughter, and soon there is laughter in his voice too. He is amazed at how quickly he swings back and forth between being a boy and a man. He does not know when he became a man. Somewhere along the way, the world grew small and rough as the splintered swing. He worries she'll start to notice the splinters, sway towards womanhood when she will not recognize her voice or remember when she became no longer a girl. But for now, she is still a little girl. And a sigh of relief comes from the man, a sound she can't tell apart from panting. If he voices his concerns, he fears they'll be overheard by the world. In the meantime, the old tree continues to gently sway, and the old rope-tied plank continues to swing. They would be there until the sun swings over the horizon and stars awoke to watch if the girl could choose. Only half the world falls under night's sway, and stars are not all that wakes, she reminds the man. What goes to sleep at night is only his world. For a moment, he does not recognize her voice. So for a little longer, his push causes the sway of the swing, and the woman does not voice that she can do without the boy's help, nor will she want to for all the world. Um, this next one is after um, my late aunt. Um, she died last summer. So this is for my Aunt Nancy. Um, it's called Living Stone. Flat gray faces underneath the hard sky, like it knows we are all holding back our own numbing rain. The salt and iron taste of bearing her body into the ground remains like the casket's edge impressed on my arm. That's not her, my sister whispers. She's gone. Just meat and bones. The rain wets new earth, and I realize I am planting coffins, yielding crops of tombstones. Our family is never closer than when we have space to fill. There is a moth who lives in your chest. Do not bury the dead. First, check the heart for the beating of little wings inside the valves and ventricles. It should sound like leaves falling. The moth is born from death. As a caterpillar, it creeps, unnoticed, into an unbandaged wound, once the bleeding slows, on a hundred pill-like feet, and plods along with each pulse until it reaches the right atrium, constructing a cocoon of the heart. The little creature dissolves to be part of the body. The pupa grows in the space between beats and sleeps by the quaking of the lung's lullaby. New tissue generates in the dead not yet dead, with similar rhythms in both chests. Only bury the dead. Stay your shaking hands, and the moth will emerge dripping with bloody cocoones. The wings will unfold and dry brilliant red, but fade to indigo with age, a metamorphosis all its own. This next one, one second. is another one of those um, kind of half prose, half poetry type pieces. <clears throat> it's called Creation and Refinement. The technical difference between clay and soil is complicated. Clay is old. Clay is formed from the bones of the earth, compacted, compressed, pure compounds. The end result of endless pulling and twisting and scratching from the soft lips and fingers of wind and water droplets. The earth's minerals cling tighter to one another like lovers afraid of being ripped apart again until only clay is left. Soil is dirt and rock and sand, the organic, the inorganic, and clay. Soil is everything. When the world breaks down into base components, it will turn into soil. When soil breaks down, it will turn to clay. It's hard to know the defining point when one becomes the other. Clay is always clay. 
even when it's left to dry and crumbles to dust and creates a thin film over the floors and walls and clothes and hands, add a little water and it sticks to itself again. It can be molded, shaped, made into almost anything. Add a little too much water and it becomes slip, glue which is used to bind clay together. Ceramics is different from other sculpture because ceramics are built up from the formless rather than carved away. After a piece is finished, it needs to dry out again, water leaving like the long, slow breath of the earth. Then it is placed amongst fire. Clay is different from soil because under extreme heat it does not crumble, but glows red like steel, or it explodes. If the wind's soft lips and water droplets' gentle fingers have left anything behind within the clay, it will not survive the core like kiln. Sometimes the shrapnel destroys other pieces as well. If it does survive, its color is bright orange or white and called green, like moss that grows green and dries white in the living soil far from fire. This, though, is clay. Once, fire, once fired, it is finished, or painted, or glazed and fired again, and again, if need be. Um, this next one is uh, pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> After hours of trying to write a different poem, I know you wish you could turn your brain off, flip a switch somewhere in between the part convincing you to approach the edge of a building and the other part telling you to jump. You never jump, so why think to? Why are you so torn? Return to adolescence, when you lied about doing things you'd never want to do, about wanting to be lonely when you were, but you didn't know the difference between being in the dark and closing your eyes. You thought it made you sound cool. What did it feel like? I don't think you could wish, I don't think you wish you could turn your brain off, but I think you wish you did. A crippling fear of not living life, petrified by not knowing where you're going. But how can you go anywhere if you never leave anywhere? Remember, you are afraid of nothing, so be afraid of nothing. Uh, this next one is actually based on true events <clears throat> that happened to me, and I've written far too many papers about it. Um, Mom, I love you, and um, this is probably not going to be the last one. <clears throat> Scars Poetica. A boy falls from a two-story window, lucky to plow into soil, not stone. His leg is still broken, and blood flows from his arm and pride. Someday, people will hang on his words the way he hung from the sill, and he'll show his battle scar far too much. Someday, he will have more than he can count. His older sister is in her first car crash. She was not driving, but now she can't stop shaking or think past the car's cracked husk. Someday, she will paint with the ink she made from dead things to bring cracked skulls to life. Within the empty sockets, flowers grow. In both, she sees what could have come to be. By chance, they will both survive. By chance, they will both be artists. He will tell his stories. She will paint what still could come to be. They'll be better for their scars. All they lost, excess. Like the boulder called the giant from which the likeness of David was carved, they put themselves into each work, made all the more whole by every part cut away. Even a complete work of art is still only called a piece. Uh, the story behind the boulder called the giant and uh, the carving of Michelangelo's David is actually kind of awesome and you should uh, all look it up when you get the chance. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that you guys can leave whenever you want because it's on YouTube <laughs> and uh, maybe possibly go just a little over, but that's okay. Um, 
This next one is called Ode to the Witch of the West. I understand your pain. I too melt down the drain with the water washing over me. How did you discover you burned at water's touch? Did you always know? Or did it develop slowly or all at once like an allergy? Your body betraying you with seemingly no cause? How did it feel when everyone around you slowly discovered you weren't like them? Did they stare? Or were they too afraid to stare? Sometimes being ignored is worse than being feared, but you know that. How did it feel when you discovered you weren't like them? Your skin turned green but never rotted, never sloughed off the bone when that was all you wanted. At least your skeleton looked more like you than your skin did. At first they said you were ill. Your twisted mind was warping your form. Why didn't they see it's how they saw you which made you so angry? Then they said you were disgusting, depraved, wicked. When you were no more grotesque than they were. They refused to use your name until no one remembered it anymore. Or maybe they never learned it in the first place. I'm sorry that even now, as I'm trying to relate to you, remember you, I'm struggling to think of what else to say. Your story is your own, as untold or altered as it might be. And I want to leave off on a positive note, and hopefully an optimistic one in this terrifying time um, that we are all faced with. So, um, <clears throat> cheers. Surprise yourself, even if they're dandelions. Mm, sorry. Cheers. <laughs> Surprise yourself with flowers, even if they're dandelions and fleabane. Keep an um, intimate arsenal of aloe and vanilla scents surrounding you like new yellow shoes bought two sizes too small. Bask in watercolored sunsets and grow infirm from ecstasy, knowing someday you will not be able to stand anyway. Here's to giving yourself all the songs never finished, half made up, half remembered, on the way home from a bad vacation, and finding peace with that. Don't be afraid to grow old with yourself. Here's to giving yourself enough. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming and listening and having, hopefully having fun. Um, take care. Take care of yourselves and others if you can. We'll get through this one way or the other, together, but separate. Okay. Good night.